Morning, church. How's everyone doing? Good. Uh, several of you have been checking in on me and asking how I've been doing. And so I wanted to let you know I did have a successful cardiac ablation a week ago Thursday. Praise God. Thank you for that. But uh, I was playing pickup basketball uh, the day before that, and I ended up jumping and coming down on a guy's foot, and I, I busted my ankle, and so that's why I'm in a, in a walking boot. It's not just for fashion, uh, but I know it looks pretty cool, uh, but uh, that's what that's about. So some, something tells me I'm getting too old to play pickup basketball, and that something is someone named Emily. So... <laughs> If you're visiting with us today, though, my name is Mark Potter. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Colonial. Our lead pastor, Pastor Jim West, is at our other campus, our Overland Park campus, this morning. He'll be back next Sunday. And, uh, you know, sometimes I think about Colonial like the fast food chain KFC. It's one restaurant. We have one church. Uh, but they have two recipes. One is original, and the other is extra crispy. So I don't know. I'm not sure what that means for Overland Park, but let's keep that joke just between us. <laughs> uh, for the past couple years, we've been making our way through John's gospel, and we're nearing an end. And uh, two weeks ago, we started into chapter 20 of John's gospel, and we have covered the first 10 verses, and that was when, as you'll recall, Mary Magdalene uh, discovered the empty tomb. Jesus' body was not there, and then she ran off to tell Peter and John, and then they had a foot race back to the tomb and to discover that Mary was telling the truth. And then last Sunday, we discussed verses 18, or 11 through 18 of chapter 20. And that's when Mary was outside of the tomb and she was weeping. And the angels came to her and then Jesus surprised her by showing up in bodily form. And he said, he said, woman, why are you crying? And whom are you seeking? And I don't know about you, but those two questions have stuck with me all week. Why are you crying? And whom are you seeking? Especially in light of the last couple years that we've all experienced. But Mary, she didn't recognize that it was Jesus, did she, until he said her name. He said, Mary. And she turned to him and she said, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And then the scripture says that Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that leads us to our scripture passage this morning in John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. So out of respect, let's stand and read the word of God together. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Thank you. Please be seated. Let's pray together. Father God, I ask you now to speak not only to me, but through me, to these your children, for your kingdom glory and for your kingdom purposes, it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. My sermon title today is Surprised and Sent, and it has three subheadings. The peace of Christ, the breath of Christ, and the commission of Christ. Let's start with the peace of Christ. As many of you are aware, uh, back in July of 2020, I was diagnosed with stage 3 colorectal cancer. And the cancer they discovered, we learned, was not only present within the tumor, but it was also present within the lymph nodes that surrounded the tumor. And I had what's called vein invasion as well. And so after I was diagnosed, after the initial shock and denial began to wear off, I was overwhelmed and overcome with a wave of great 
fear. I started playing through all the what ifs in my head. I hid it well, but deep down I was afraid, afraid of what the future held, afraid of, of losing my wife, afraid of not being there to watch my kids grow up, afraid of dying young. And I have to believe that the same type of fear, that same wave of fear that I experienced was similar to what the disciples were experiencing here in our passage of scripture. After the initial shock and denial that Jesus, their leader, their master, their king had been crucified and that the body was no longer there, that someone might have stolen it, after that initial shock and denial wore off, they, that would have been followed with a great deal, a wave of fear that the Jewish authorities that had come to arrest and kill Jesus were now coming after them. So out of fear, the disciples, they gathered there on that Sunday night, all except Thomas and Judas, with the doors locked for fear that the Jewish authorities were kind of going to come and arrest them. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus just shows up in their midst. He didn't go through the door. The door was closed and locked, but he just sort of appears and they were so surprised that they didn't even recognize him. And this begs the question, has Jesus' presence ever surprised you when you were afraid? Has Jesus' presence ever surprised you when you were afraid? About six months after I was diagnosed, I began radiation treatment. And as I was in the waiting room, awaiting radiation in the cancer center, I began talking to the lady that was sitting across from me. And we kind of started to get to know each other and started talking about our treatment and our diagnoses and the fears that we had. And as we were talking, another man appeared seemingly out of nowhere right next to me and he started standing beside me and he overheard the conversation that we were having and he picked up on my name. And he said to me, are you Mark? I said, maybe. No, I didn't say that. I said, yes. And he said, Mark Potter? I said, yes. And I could see that tears started welling up in his eyes. And he said, I've been praying for you every day. He said, my name is Roger. And one of, I'm neighbors with one of the, the members at your church. And he said, I heard your story and I've started praying for you. But the craziest part of the whole story is that the lady that was sitting right next to us across from me, her name was Angel. <laughs> you just can't make this stuff up. <laughs> we were sitting there, complete strangers, the three of us right there in the cancer room waiting to receive radiation, and Jesus just surprised us by showing up and bringing peace in the midst of our fear. Friends, that's what Jesus does, isn't it? Jesus meets us in our fear and he surprises us with his presence and with his peace, just like he did for the disciples on that night, uh, uh, the same night as his resurrection. The scripture says that while the doors were still locked, Jesus appeared and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and he showed them his side and the disciples were glad you think? <laughs> they were glad. That's like the understatement of the century by John, right? The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, he said, peace be with you. And so Jesus speaks a blessing of peace over them twice in a row, in verse 19 and in verse 21. And when he said this, the disciples, they would have been reminded of, of the time that Jesus had promised peace to them when they were having the same conversation in the upper room just a few days earlier. When Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he said, in this world you won't have any trouble. Is that what he said? <laughs> Did he say, in this world you might have trouble? Did he say you could have a little bit of trouble? No. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart because I have overcome the world. This is not just a random verse that God laid on my heart 
for me to share today. Because I know for a fact that there are many people sitting in these pews that have been experiencing many troubles. And I want you to know that even though you will have trouble, that Jesus says to you today, take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus Christ has overcome the world and brought peace in the midst of our trouble. Praise God. When Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared uh, to the disciples on that Easter night. The peace of God was embodied. It was made manifest right before their very eyes. Thereby, Jesus ushered in a new creation. Why do I say that? Well, John is basically gearing up to show us that Jesus is initiating new creation. The Hebrew word for peace, as many of you know, is shalom. And shalom was both a common greeting, but it also had deep theological significance. Shalom means peace, but it also means prosperity and wholeness of relationship with God and with others. And this is exactly what was present at the beginning of creation when God gave Adam and Eve every good and perfect gift to enjoy with God and with one another in the garden. And so if I were to greet you today by saying shalom to you, what I'm saying is that may God richly bless you by giving you every good and godly gift. In other words, may you experience that same type of wholeness, that same type of peace and prosperity of relationship that God granted Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. According to New Testament scholar Bruce Milne, he says, Jesus' greeting of shalom on Easter is the complement of Jesus saying, it is finished at the cross. For the peace of reconciliation of life is now imparted. Shalom, according to Milne, is a supremely Easter greeting. At the cross, man declared war on God. But at the resurrection, God declared peace to all those who believe. For when, uh, when we experience the peace of Christ, we experience a taste of God's shalom. This leads me to my second subheading, which is the breath of Christ. Jesus said to them, he said, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, even now I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Again, John is tapping into this creation narrative quite a bit here. For example, in verse 19, which we read at the beginning of the day today, he's, John reemphasizes the fact that Jesus does all of this and appears to them on the first day of the week. This is Genesis 1 language, isn't it? You remember the story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, kind of like that empty tomb. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said what? Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and so he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the day a light day and the darkness night. And there was evening and there was morning. On which day? On the first day. As you recall, John continually refers to Jesus in his gospel as the light, the light of men and the light of the world and the true light which gives light to everyone. So what's John getting at here? He's getting at the fact that new creation has begun with Jesus, the light, who rose on the first day. By the way, as a reminder to you all, this is why that we continue to gather on the first day of the week, each and every Sunday. And it's been like that for 2,000 years, hasn't it? That's the custom of the church. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And thankfully, we don't have to wait until April of 2023 Amen. to celebrate Resurrection Sunday because as far as I'm concerned, every single Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Sticking with this theme of new creation, remember last Sunday we read that Mary of Mary Magdalene, she mistook Jesus for who? 
for a gardener. And again, uh, this is creation language. In fact, Jesus told his disciples back in John chapter 15, verse 1, that he is the true vine and his father is the what? The gardener. You see the irony? Mary saw Jesus and thought he was a gardener, which is exactly what Jesus told his disciples that his father is. Continuing along the lines of new creation, in verse 22 of John chapter 20, we read that Jesus breathed on them. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. The same spirit, back in Genesis, that was the one hovering over the waters. And now, uh, with regard to the Holy Spirit being sent here in John's gospel, much debate has occurred over the centuries with regard to this episode of the Holy Spirit being sent. What was John talking about? I mean, did he not read his Bible? Did he not know about Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? Was this John's version of that? Was this a separate private sending of the Holy Spirit? What's all this about? That is a great question for Pastor Jim. That's really good. You can email him at jwest at colonialcase.org. He'd be happy to get 300 emails from all of you. But seriously, with regard to this question, there are several, several theories. John Calvin, for example, attempted to distinguish John 20 as the sprinkling of the Holy Spirit as opposed to Acts chapter 2, which was the saturation of the Holy Spirit sent at Pentecost. Brooke Westcott, another theologian, viewed the power of new life that was imparted in John chapter 20, whereas the power for ministry was imparted in Acts chapter 2. While F.F. F. Bruce said, no, that was the, it's actually the other way around. <laughs> but if you want to know my opinion, it's that John is both keenly aware of the historical significance of the Spirit being sent in Acts chapter 2, and he is keenly aware of the theological significance of Jesus breathing on his disciples the night of the resurrection. Remember, John is making a case for new creation, which had come in the resurrected Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, John could not and would not ignore what he experienced on Easter night in that intimate setting with the Spirit being breathed out upon the disciples. As you recall, for the greater part of seven chapters of John's gospel, Jesus continued to reference the Spirit coming saying things like, Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. He said, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. Jesus also said, when he comes, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. And so this is John's way of testifying that the Holy Spirit had come. It's not to contradict or to negate what occurred in Acts chapter 2. John is well aware of that. But it's to testify that the Spirit had indeed come just as Jesus said that he would. But John was not just eager to testify that the Spirit had come. He was also eager to testify how he had come, which is that Jesus breathed on them. Why is this important? Well, the Greek verb for to breathe on is emphasau. Everyone say emphasau. Good. You get an A in Greek. I got a C, but you, you get an A. That's good. Uh, emphasau is the same root word as the word emphysema. And emphasau means to breathe on or to blow on or to exhale. And as a result of emphasau, the concept is insufflation, that is filling one's lungs with air. This is significant, again, because John thinks in terms of new creation and new life. And the Jewish readers, when they read this, would be taken back to the story of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that says, Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground, and he, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And so Jesus breathing his life-giving spirit onto his disciples was reminiscent of God breathing life into Adam's nostrils back in Genesis chapter 2. 
A New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says this, he says, in Genesis 2, 7, God breathed into human nostrils his own breath, the breath of life, and humankind became alive, alive with God's life. Now in the new creation, the restoring life of God breathed out through Jesus, making new people of the disciples and through them, offering this new life to the world. Warren Wearsby describes it like this. He says, the breath of God in the first creation meant physical life, and the breath of God in Jesus Christ in the new creation meant spiritual life. In summary, John believed that breathing on his disciples was indicative of new creation and new life, effectively restoring what was lost in the garden due to human rebellion. And this leads me to my third and final subheading, which is the commission of Christ. All of you have likely heard of the the Great Commission found in Matthew chapter 28. But did you know that all four Gospels have a version of the commissioning of Christ to his disciples? And this is John's version in John chapter 20, verse 21, when he says, As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Again, this would have reminded the disciples of not only the creation narrative, but also what they had just been learning from Jesus and his teaching in the upper room just a few days ago. As you know, the incarnation of Jesus is the sending of God to earth to dwell among us. And Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer in John 17, he said, you sent me into the world so that I have sent them into the world, and therefore the disciples were to mirror that sent nature of God and the work of Christ in a broken and hurting world. In addition to the incarnation, though, the disciples would have been reminded of the consequences of the fall of man, the fall of creation, when God punished Adam and Eve for their rebellion, for eating that apple from the, or that fruit from the tree of of the knowledge of good and evil by not only causing death, but also by exiling them, by sending them out of the garden as the first exiles. But here in John chapter 20, instead of exiling them, Jesus sent them out as evangelists. After the fall of creation, God sent his children away due to sin, but after Christ's sacrifice, these exiles find a home, a permanent home called heaven. And then after the resurrection of Jesus, God sends his children away again, but this time not due to their rebellion, but because of Christ's victory. Jesus' disciples were sent to share the good news that Jesus is alive. In other words, the resurrection causes the disciples, including you and me, to form a new identity and a new calling, a commissioning. Our identity has now been transformed from guilty to grateful, punished to pardon, sinner to sent, exile to evangelist. In short, we have been commissioned by Jesus to share the good news that he is alive. As the disciples were sent, they became apostles. Apostles are godly messengers who have been sent by Jesus out into the world on mission. It's a New Testament concept, but it's rooted in Old Testament language. According to Milne, he says this, the presence of the exalted Lord is the authorization of our mission. This is what apostle means. One whom Jesus sends and accompanies. In this sense, the church in every age is an apostolic community. And every Christian witness, sent and authorized by the risen and reigning one, belongs to the apostolate of the the Lord. Behind this Christian reality lies a Jewish model. The Selia, or messenger. In Hebrew culture, the Selia embodied the dignity and authority of the one in whose name he had come. One who is sent is as the one who sends him. To slight a Selia was therefore to slight his master. Correspondingly, 
to respect a Salia by obeying the message he brought was to respect his master. As the sent ones of Jesus, we speak with his authority. I know that's a lot of words, but after reading that, I would like to ask you a question. And that question is this. Where is God sending you? Now, I know that there are a few of you here that God will send to a place far, far away to share the gospel, the good news that he has risen. But I know for all of us, God is asking us and calling us, commanding us and commissioning us to share the gospel right where we are, in the places we live, learn, work, and play. So in answering the question, where is God sending me, you can begin by asking yourself, who are the people in my life that I already know that need to hear the gospel? And if you can't think of anyone, that's a sign of a larger problem. Do you have regular opportunities to share the gospel? Some of you are thinking, well, I don't have any non-Christian friends. Please don't get too isolated or insulated from the outside world that you lose contact or even friendship, relationship with non-Christians. Others of you are thinking, I know some Baptists down the street, I could share the gospel with them. <laughs> Newsflash, Baptists are believers too. I don't mean to pick on Baptists. Uh, a lot of times Colonial is called Baptarian, and so we, uh, we have that in common. Others have called Colonial Presbycostal. So there you go. We got, I'll give you some new terminology here. But the point is that you need to be careful not to isolate or insulate yourselves from non-Christians. We are actually in the process right now of, of recruiting blessed group leaders for the summer, opening up your home and hosting a group. And part of that is to build Christian community. But the other part of that is to invite your non-Christian neighbors to experience what Christian community is all about. And so if you're interested in, in hosting a blessed group for the summer, we would love nothing more than for you to sign up to do that. And so you can talk to myself or to our Connections Director, Tori Smith, after the service today. But uh, speaking of sharing Christ with our neighbors and sharing the hope that Jesus is alive, Last Sunday, the children's ministry here at Colonial, they gave my oldest son, Caden, some, some resurrection eggs. And that's the basically retelling of the Easter story through Easter eggs. And so he had these resurrection eggs after church. They were sitting in my car. And for whatever reason, he left them in my car, which isn't super uncommon. But I remember thinking in my head, I should really tell him to go and take, come back out and take those back in the house. But I didn't do that. Uh, I just left them there. And then the next morning, Monday morning, this past Monday, we carpooled to, to school with two of Caden's friends, and we always carpool every day, but that was my turn to drive. And so right when the other two kids get in the car, of course, what's sitting there? That Easter carton of resurrection eggs. And so Caden grabs the carton of eggs. The first thing he does, he opens them. And he's starting to share them with his friends. But the thing is, is that one of his best friends is Jewish and the other one is Hindu. <laughs> and so these three kids are piled in the back of my car and Caden is going through the, the gospel story with a Jewish friend and a Hindu friend. And we get to the egg that has the, the replica of the crown of thorns in it. And the Jewish friend says, why is Jesus called king of the Jews? And then we get to the, the, the egg that has the little spear in it that pierced Jesus' side, proving that he was dead. And the little friend that was Indian, his family came from India, said, Jesus is still dead, right? And then when we're in the carpool line, Caden gets the last egg, the, the, the white egg at the very end, and it's empty. And 
we had the opportunity to share with the kids that, no, Jesus is not dead, but he's alive. He is raised from the dead. And this is part of what it entails being sent to share the good news that John's gospel is talking about here in John chapter 20. Sharing the good news that Jesus is alive. But the second part of that, and the lastly, it entails being sent to proclaim forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. In verse 23, it says, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. But if you withhold forgiveness of any, it is withheld. Based on the the way that the Greek reads, uh, this verse could have been better stated. Those whose sins you forgive had been previously forgiven, and those whose sins you do not forgive have been previously unforgiven. But can you imagine being told this by Jesus? Being one to say that Jesus says to you, you are now empowered to offer forgiveness of sins or withhold the forgiveness. It's a massive job, isn't it? But that is what Jesus says to them and that's what Jesus says to us. Now I think it's safe to assume and to say that none of us has the authority to forgive sins. The Bible clearly tells us that, doesn't it? That only God possesses that authority. But although we can't provide forgiveness of sin based on our authority, we can proclaim and pronounce forgiveness of sin based on his authority. N.T. Wright says, uh, he says this regarding to forgiveness. He says, they are to pronounce in God's name and by his spirit the message of forgiveness to all who believe in Jesus. They are also to retain sins, to warn the world that the sin is a serious deadly disease and that to remain in it will bring death. They are to rebuke and to warn, not because they don't like people or because they are seeking power or prestige for themselves, but because this is God's message to a muddled, confused, and still rebellious world. A decade ago, or two, uh, there was a buzzword surrounding the church in America, and it was a word called missional. Every church was trying to grab hold of this word and become missional. It was a movement spreading through the church in the United States. And it was a good thing. But as I kept hearing this word over and over again, I wanted to to pause and ask the question, is the church actually missional? Because the truth is, is that if we don't talk about Jesus and share the gospel with our non-Christian neighbors, co-workers, and classmates, then we're not missional. And the same thing can be said about the word evangelical. If we don't talk about Jesus outside of our Christian bubble or share the incredible news that forgiveness of of sin is offered in and through Jesus Christ, that he and he alone pardons us from the horrific effects of our sin, then we're not actually evangelical. We're not really even a church. We're just a social club with decent coffee, free childcare, and weird music. (laughs) I love our music, but it's kind of weird to the outside world, right? I think you get the point. If we're not communicating the forgiveness of sins that are offered in Jesus Christ, then we're actually not missional or evangelical. And so we need to ask ourselves this question. Are we known for proclaiming Christ's forgiveness in this broken and hurting world? Or are we known for something else? Let's covenant together to tell the world about this man named Jesus who has overcome the grave, spoken peace, breathed out new life, and offered forgiveness of sin to all those who believe. Will you pray with me?
Lord God, we give thanks for the person and work of Jesus Christ who constantly surprises us with his presence, especially when we're in times of trouble. And God, we also give thanks that we have been sent out to share the hope that we have experienced for ourselves to a hurting and broken world that needs to hear it. So Lord, empower us by way of your Holy Spirit to do just that, not for our own benefit or our own glory, but to advance the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.